Welcome everyone. I'm AJ Albanak, a senior philanthropy officer at the Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights. We are grateful you're able to join us for this webinar about the Young Center's advocacy as it revolves around the question of immigrant children's best interests, their wishes, their safety, and their well-being, both in immigration court and asylum hearings and in the halls of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Today, Young Center staff from around the country will share how best interest advocacy drives our direct service work. Uh, we will share case stories about children we have served and give insight into our policy work at the federal level. A content warning for today's webinar, some of the stories we are sharing include mentions of suicide, violence, and abuse experienced by children. Also, all names used in reference to children we serve Quick note regarding interaction, on the bottom of your screen, you should have a chat box where you can send your questions throughout the presentation. We are reserving plenty of time for questions after the presentation. We will, however, end the webinar promptly at 1 p.m. Central. We also recommend switching to speaker view for best viewing, and you will see that we are experimenting today with the use of auto captioning for Zoom in order to improve our accessibility for people attending the webinar. The Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights is a human rights organization dedicated to protecting the rights and best interests, the wishes, safety, and well being of immigrant children. We are the only nonprofit that provides independent child advocates who meet with children in government custody every week to accompany and support them and advocate for their rights, safety, and well being. Young Center Child Advocates are appointed to the most vulnerable immigrant children, including children forcibly separated from their parents at the border, children with mental or physical disabilities, children who are pregnant or parenting, children who are victims of human trafficking, and children who have witnessed or experienced violence. We also advocate for an immigration system where children are recognized as children and no decision is made without first considering their best interests. This year, more than 120,000 unaccompanied immigrant children are expected to arrive at our border seeking safety. This is the result of a number of factors. Thousands of unaccompanied children were deported directly from the border during the prior administration. Some were forced to wait in dangerous conditions in Mexico under the Remain in Mexico policy. Many of these children, next year is, <laughs> Sorry, freezing. Many of these children are now returning to seek safety. Other children are fleeing because of instability in their home countries. That leaves children vulnerable with no government authority to turn to when their homes or communities are unsafe. When all of these children proceed through the immigration and asylum systems seeking safety in the US, there is still no requirement in the law that immigration judges or other federal officials consider a child's best interests when making life or death decisions. After 18 years of Young Center advocacy, immigration judges now ask for child advocates and take our recommendations on immigrant children's best interests into account. In 2020, more than 85% of our recommendations were granted by decision makers, meaning more children's best interests were protected. But our next step is to change law and policy to guarantee that immigrant children's best interests are permanently protected. Today, for the next minutes, you are going to meet three Young Center staff members and learn about some of the successes your support has been for, as well as some of the challenges we continue to face on the front lines of our advocacy to ensure immigrant and asylum seeking children's We'll introduce you first to Young Center Houston staff attorney Daisy Lee, who is going to discuss the best interest pair. Prior to joining the Young Center, Daisy worked as an associate attorney practicing social security disability law, where she worked with both adults and children with mental and physical disabilities. Our San Antonio office's social worker, Liz Farias, is going to share a couple case stories where best interests came into play in the Young Center's recommendations. Elizabeth holds a master's degree in social work and has worked with immigrant survivors of domestic violence via a practice that revolves restorative and trauma-informed. And finally, the Young Center's policy analyst, Robert Cutter, will discuss the Young Center's advocacy on Capitol Hill and with the White House with the goal of getting a federal best interest mandate. Prior to joining the Young Center, Robert was a Nancy Hale Fellow at Third Way, a Washington, D.C. Daisy, you can take it away. 
so I will be discussing the Child Advocate Program. So as child advocates, we're third parties who make independent recommendations regarding the best interest of a child. We make recommendations that address every decision in a child's case from the moment they're apprehended by the government and placed in government custody until the final decision in their legal case. This means that we're submitting recommendations to federal officials who decide whether the child would be released to a parent or sponsor, but also to immigration judges and asylum officials. Since 2004, the Young Center's mission has been to advocate for the best interest for the safety and well being of unaccompanied and separated immigrant children. Our child advocate program goal is the consideration of a child's best interest in every decision surrounding the child from custody, placement, release, legal representation, repatriation, permanency, to the need for medical, mental health, or other services at the government's expense. We effectively advocate for a child's best interest with our child program, child advocate program model. We're an organization made up of attorneys and social workers who apply a child's rights framework to advocate with every federal agency. We also have a volunteer-based model where we recruit, train, and screen bilingual and bicultural volunteers who donate a generous amount of their time to get to know the child and help identify their needs, all while under the supervision of a Young Center attorney or social worker. The TVPRA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, which we at the Young Center helped write, provides for the Department of Health and Human Services appointment of child advocates and provides our access to materials needed for effective advocacy by statutory authority. While the TVPRA provides for our appointments as child advocates, we do not have decision-making authority. We are not decision makers, but rather make recommendations to be considered by different government officials who are ultimately not bound to follow best interest determinations. Therefore, our advocacy is directed at different decision makers and stakeholders. For example, directed to ORR, the Office of Refugee and Resettlement, which is the agency that has custody of the children. When advocating with ORR, we center our advocacy and submit best interest determinations with respect to the safe placement, transfer, prompt release of a child, development, developmentally appropriate and trauma-informed services while in custody. For the Department of Justice and USCIS, the US Citizenship and Immigration Services, which are the agencies that make decisions about a child's legal case, we submit best interest determinations with respect to safety and permanency when, for example, a child seeks asylum or seeks protection as a survivor or trafficking of a victim or a victim. For DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, the agency that detains adult family members and which returns people to their home country, we submit best interest determination as it relates to family integrity, permanency, protection, and safe repatriation. And now we'll talk a little bit about the best interest paradigm that our work is based on. As child advocates, our role is to advocate for a child's best interest with, uh, while the child is subject to immigration proceedings. Advocacy that ranges from custody and release to advocating for legal representation or medical and mental health services to advocating on the ultimate decision of whether the child will be allowed to remain in the US. Again, before the Young Center, um, as AJ mentioned, there was no one championing for the best interests of children in immigration proceedings. Still, currently there is no requirement in federal law that immigration authorities should consider a child's best interest when making a decision on that child. Unfortunately, immigration law doesn't recognize children as distinct from adults. It is not created to consider the best interest of a child, which has a great detrimental effect on a child on their safety and well-being. It puts children at risk of prolonged stays in detention, puts them at risk of family separation, risk of deportation and being returned to a country that's dangerous and just not fit for a child. So as champions for immigrant children, we at the Young Center created this best interest paradigm that we use to make recommendations and determinations when assessing a child's 
best interest. This Young Center Created Paradigm is based on child welfare and international law and evaluates the best interests that these children, the interests that these children have in their wishes, in their safety, in family integrity, in their liberty, in their development and their identity. We apply this paradigm in our daily work with children. We visit with the child each week while they're in government custody, detained in a shelter and establish a relationship built on trust. We learn their stories. We help the child think through their options and empower them to make informed decisions. We accompany the child to court hearings, meetings and interviews. We also conduct social science research on the child's situation and conditions in his, in his or her home country. We then develop written best interest determinations using this paradigm that we provide to different stakeholders, from ICE officers to immigration judges to ORR to DHS officials. The majority of our best interest determinations we submit to the government are in writing and are filed in the form of legal briefs. We also do make recommendations as part of meetings and conversations with government officials. The recommendations can vary depending on each child's situation. For example, we may advocate that they be given extra blankets at night, to be provided more clothing, to advocating that they be given more time to speak to family and home country, advocating for special needs in support of legal relief, or asylum claims so that they may be allowed to remain in the US and not return to a country that is not safe for them. After 18 years of advocacy, government, government officials across the board ask for child advocates to be assigned to children facing deportation and ask to see our best interest determinations. Over the years, even government attorneys who are trying to have the children deported from the country have asked us to be appointed to cases. In one case specifically, a government attorney who suspected that a child was being trafficked asked for the appointment of a child advocate. And in that case, we were able to help the child find a safe place to live. Next, we'll talk about the challenges in developing best interest determinations. So the majority of the time, the child's wishes and the safest options are aligned which works out perfectly. However, this isn't always the case. Sometimes it's not so clear what a child's best interest is. Sometimes we have to work through a child's express for his best interest. For example, when a child wants to return to home country, but there's no one that the child can safely return home to because the child's caretakers were killed and there's no one who can adequately care for the child or other times when a child is trafficked and wants to be released to their trafficker because they're too young to realize that they were being trafficked due to that being the only life that they've ever known. Another challenge in developing best interest determinations requires acknowledgement that best interest is a loaded term. And if you have experience in domestic child welfare system, you know that best interest has been used as a weapon against black families and families of color because people interpret best interest without taking into account any implicit bias, explicit bias, structural racism, and paternalism. For 18 years, the Young Center has worked hard to identify moments where bias can negatively impact best interest determinations and build safeguards to limit bias. These safeguards include a child's rights-based approach to best interest, that means we will not overrule a child's expressed interests unless there's a serious threat to their safety. Also, we make sure there isn't just one single person working on a case, especially when the recommendation might conflict with the child's wishes. We work in teams and our teams have levels of review. We staff complex cases internally and discuss complex issues with our teams that includes an amazing group of attorneys and social workers who are experts in our work as child advocates and who bring their own expertise to our cases. We also discuss complex cases with any of our other eight offices across the US. Finally, in exceptionally challenging cases, we seek the help of external sources to help us look at a case objectively. We convene best interest determination panels comprised of 
experts as envisioned by the United States High Commissioner for Refugees 2008 and 2018 interest determination guidelines. We seek expert opinions on the type of harm a child is facing, for example, trafficking or interpersonal violence. We seek experts that can speak on country conditions in the child's home country, particularly in best interest determinations for legal relief, where we demonstrate that returning the child to home country would harm their health, safety, or well being. We also work with other experts that can speak on social science research that, explain, that explains key principles in the fields of child development, trauma, identity, effects of detention and any other research that the specific case requires. Overall, we use our best interest paradigm and our best interest determination with the ultimate goal of changing the immigration system so that best interest is made a part of the decision-making process when it comes to children, so that children and immigration proceedings are recognized just as what they are, children. And now I'll pass it on to Liz, who will share case examples of how we've applied our best interest paradigm in our advocacy. Thank you, Daisy. Today, I'm gonna to discuss two case studies that we have worked on and that I was specifically advocating for. So the first one is Juan. Juan is a four-year-old boy from Guatemala. Juan came to the United States with his father. The plan was for Juan and his father to go to Florida to live with the father's girlfriend, whom Juan knew as his mother, although they had only ever met via video call. Juan and his father were apprehended and put in detention together. While in ICE detention, Juan's father died by suicide. Juan was sent to an extended care placement after this occurred. Juan had contact with his father's girlfriend who intended to sponsor him. When COVID hit, she lost her job and was having a hard time providing for herself and Juan's half sibling. Juan had remained in contact with his paternal aunt in Guatemala, who had cared for Juan since he was an infant until his journey to the United States with his father. During that time, staff from the Office of Refugee Resettlement took away access for Juan to speak to his stepmother due to his father never officially marrying her and only allowed communication with his paternal aunt and birth mother, whom Juan did not have a relationship. The Young Center advocated with ORR to allow Juan to speak with the stepmother as he wanted to remain in contact with her, but it was denied. Juan had a few conversations with his birth mother, but it was clear to all that he did not know her. During this time, he held a strong relationship with his paternal aunt, who was also caring for another sibling of his in Guatemala. Juan would light up when speaking with his aunt, and it was clear to all parties involved that she had raised and cared for him for a significant time. After speaking with his birth mother and paternal aunt, both made it clear that it was their desire for Juan to return to Guatemala to live with his per per paternal aunt like he had always done prior to his trip to the United States. Due to the fact that access to his father's girlfriend was taken away and he had never in fact met her, the young center determined it was in his best interest to return to his paternal aunt in Guatemala. A bid report was submitted to the immigration judge in support of Juan returning to Guatemala. The legal, the legal service provider originally wanted Juan to remain in the United States pending litigation related to his father's death. Um, and they wanted to wait until that was completed. After a lot of advocacy, including home studies that were conducted to determine Juan's safety, considering consideration towards the child's wishes to live with his paternal aunt, maintaining the family integrity and ensuring his liberty to be free from detention, the legal service provider ultimately agreed with the child advocate that it was in his best interest, given Juan's age and trauma experience, to return to Guatemala to his paternal aunt's care. The judge granted voluntary departure and Juan was reunited with his maternal aunt where he is currently living and thriving. The next case study will go to a 17 year old young lady from El Salvador named Cecilia. She came to the United States seeking asylum. At a young age, Cecilia experienced sexual abuse and trafficking in her home country. At the age of 12, Cecilia ran away from her grandparents' home due to the sexual abuse she was experiencing at the hands of her grandfather. During her journey, a woman offered her refugee who ultimately held her hostage and attacked her and trafficked her. One day, her abductor went to town and accidentally left the gate unlocked. Cecilia took this as her opportunity to escape. 
When she was in a safe location, Cecilia remembered the phone number of the only person she trusted, her cousin. She called her cousin, who helped her find a safe haven with an elderly woman named Olga. Olga cared and nurtured for Cecilia until her trip to the United States. Cecilia came to the United States alone. Cecilia had no known family in the United States. The Young Center Child Advocate supported Cecilia through her application with the Office of Trafficking in Persons, and ultimately we were able to get her placement with the Unaccompanied Refugee Minors Program, which works with people that have experienced sex trafficking. While, consider while considering Cecilia's best interests, she came to the Advocate two months before her 18th birthday. Cecilia brought up the desire to live with a woman from the same village that Olga, the person who had given her safety, was from. Olga also knew this person from this village. However, Cecilia did not know her in person. She knew her video via video calls. The home study was conducted to determine safety in this woman's home and conversations with Cecilia and Olga on Cecilia's desire to live with this woman, the Young Center decided that it was in Cecilia's best interest to be released on her own recognizance to this woman from the same her 18th birthday. This decision was based on shared history and culture and a lot of advocacy was done to make it happen due to the fact that they did not know each other in person and had only met via video call. ICE ultimately accepted our best interest determination and Cecilia flew to her new home on her 18th birthday. She is now attending school and thriving where she currently is staying. I will now pass it over to Robert who will discuss um, some policy issues that come into play. Thank you, Liz, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, let me just begin by apologizing for the suboptimal lighting. I feel like I have a bit of a film noir look going at the moment, so hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, for the policy team, uh, integrating best interests of immigrant children into law and policy drives everything that we do on the policy team. While our advocacy on the Hill and with the administration is often fluid by necessity, we are able to use best interest as a guidepost to set our agenda. And to that end, our goal is to change the immigration system so that children in immigration proceedings are recognized as children and their best interests are considered in every decision made about them. With the change in administrations and Congress in January, new possibilities open that just weren't available for the last four years. As an example, in February, we were delivered a big victory as the Biden administration released its US Citizenship Act and included amongst the provisions in the bill, a mandate that the best interest of the child shall be the guiding principle of all decisions made regarding children at the border. The inclusion of this language is something to celebrate and likely would not have been possible without the advocacy and the focus on best interests the Young Center has maintained for 18 years. However, given the realities of a divided Congress, and the need for 60 votes to pass nearly any legislation through the Senate. Uh, only legislation that can gather broad bipartisan support is actually moving at the moment. And as a result, we've had to use a range of strategies to integrate best interest into federal law and the policies and practices that agencies use when making decisions about children. Broadly, our best interest work can be sorted into four categories. We meet regularly with members of Congress and their staff to socialize or re-socialize best interest. This uh, work includes helping members of Congress understand that immigrant children don't have the benefit of having their best interests considered as a matter of law, and it really depends on whether or not they have access to a child advocate. We want, and we want to ensure that every child in any court case has their best interests considered. We also advocate with offices to have best interest included in existing legislation. As members of Congress introduce bills on related immigration issues, uh, we're regularly working with them to include language about best interest and what best interest means. Uh, and that's the paradigm that Daisy discussed earlier. Uh, and, and that focuses on children's safety, their wishes, their rights to family, liberty, uh, to grow and to develop, and to develop their own identity. Our work also extends to having the best interests of immigrant children accounted for in fiscal year uh, 
2022 appropriations spending. And that's something I'll discuss in more detail in a moment. And we also uh, directly engage the administration on a number of issues to ensure that every federal agency considers best interests in its decision-making. And I'll discuss that further on my final slide. So an integral part of our policy work is our outreach to Hill offices to familiarize new offices and remind our pre-existing relationships of the importance of establishing a federal best interest mandate for all decisions concerning immigrant children. These conversations help us familiarize offices with the challenges immigrant children face, and it also helps us find our champions on the Hill. As an example, we led a congressional briefing with Senator Merkley's office on the harms of family detention. That, that opportunity only arose from years of work and consultation with his staff, including a direct meeting between the Senator and our executive director. We brought one of the Young Center's most senior social work experts to the briefing to talk about the harm children experience when they're with their parents, but also locked up with their parents. Uh, and this is a good point uh, or a good opportunity to underscore uh, that we try to ground all of our policy advocacy in the Young Center's direct service to children through the Child Advocate Program. And as often the case, as much as the Hill staff may have listened to the policy people uh, who spoke, it was our national social work director, as well as directly impacted families who really captured their attention. And while we have a unique perspective in our policy work, uh, because of our work as child advocates, we collaborate closely with other groups when talking to Congress or the administration. That includes national organizations that are experts in child protection, like the Children's Defense Fund and UNICEF, but also community-based organizations who have just as much to say about how children are harmed by the current system. We also work with experts in children's health and development and in juvenile justice. We want to make sure that children uh, have that all children have the same rights and same protection from government involvement in their lives. During our conversations with Hill offices, we also submit and help members prepare questions for congressional hearings. We work with our Young Center teams across the country to support congressional offices before they travel to sites where children are in custody or where they go to court, and we try to give members the information they need to make these trips a success. We also work with offices to find spots wherever possible where best interest language can be inserted into legislation. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, without a federal best interest mandate, apart from the anti-trafficking law, the Trafficking Victims Protection uh, Reauthorization Act, and, and that bill's language on child advocates, the insertion of best interest language into bills already moving on the Hill allows us to strengthen protection for children, um, at least in a piecemeal fashion. And we successfully incorporated best interest provisions in two bills uh, that were introduced this session. So we spent much of the early part of this year working in collaboration with other child welfare organizations to develop um, appropriation recommendations for fiscal year 2022. Uh, to federal agencies that make decisions about immigrant children uh, that prioritize their best interest. The yearly appropriations process determines how much money each agency will have to do its work in the coming year. Um, in short, it's the federal budgeting process, and it's about as messy as uh, you can expect. The president issues a proposed budget, the House and Senate both decide uh, what they want to fund, and then everyone uh, has the job of coming to the table to agree on spending. Um, so again, it's, it's messy and it's complicated, uh, but it's an important opportunity to educate the White House and members of Congress on how they can allocate funds to improve a system that regularly fails immigrant children. We spent, uh, we spend time each year on this process. Uh, and as one example, a couple of years ago, we persuaded members of Congress on both the House and the Senate to include language that directs the federal government to start using the money Congress appropriates to them to develop more small community-based homes for children in government custody and to move away from the large uh, detention centers where children are at greater risk of harm. 
So this year, our recommendations um, this year included increased funding for legal services, post-relief services, and child advocates. Uh, guardrails around emergency facilities at or near the border so that children spend no more than 72 hours in emergency facilities. And then after that are moved to spaces with case management, full services and kid appropriate spaces. We've also recommended continued increases in community based and small settings for children um, who are in the custody of the Office of Refugee Settlement. Uh, we've additionally recommended increased funding to train staff to meet the diverse needs um, that children have, um, and that includes young children, children with disabilities, children with mental health needs, um, as well as children who are at risk of aging out of the um, unaccompanied children program, the UC program, and being transferred to ICE detention at age 18. Um, and lastly, we've also recommended uh, funding to detailed staff from Health and Human Services to the Department of Homeland Security's reception centers at the border to expedite release. I want to take a moment uh, to explain this in some greater detail uh, because it's something the Young Center is focused on, a particular place where the immigration system still lags decades behind the child welfare system. So many children arrive to the border with trusted, loving caregivers uh, with whom they could be released safely. At present, uh, they are separated and the children are placed in the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. So to ensure that children's rights to family unity and to protect their mental and physical health, we've proposed a model for expediting the release of children who arrive with a non-parent close family member uh, directly at the border. Uh, this allows trained child welfare experts within the Office of Refugee Resettlement to evaluate the relationship between the child and the adult who brings them to the border while the adult and the child remain together. Right now, OR only gets to evaluate the relationship after the child has been separated um, from their grandmother, their aunt, uncle, or their adult sibling. If OR can confirm that the relationship is safe, the children could be released with their adult family member and they could do so as a family and avoid the completely unnecessary family separation that occurs in far too many cases. Uh, so the change in administrations gave us the opportunity to engage a White House much more receptive to an immigrant and child friendly message. Um, and since the results of the election became clear, we've done just that. During the transition period from November to January, we spoke with the Biden transition team on a number of issues. And these included ending policies that led to family separation, including Title 42, uh, which is the policy that blocks asylum seekers at the border um, on the pretense of the pandemic, um, speeding up the reunification of children and families so that children spend less time in custody expanding access to legal representation and child advocate services, and ending congregant care detention and creating guidelines around, as well as limiting access to influx facilities. In the first few months, the administration um, has acted on several of our recommendations. For example, the Biden-Harris administration ended the harmful information sharing agreement that was reached in 2018 under the Trump administration and that agreement resulted uh, in the result uh, resulted in the arrest and deportation of relatives un of unaccompanied children who came forward as potential sponsors um, and the Biden administration's uh, termination of that agreement um, ended that practice. We've continued to out our outreach to the administration by collaborating with members of Congress to question agency officials including the Department of Homeland Security's Secretary uh, Alejandro Mayorkas uh, at congressional hearings. In this work, we have pushed the administration to prioritize children's best interests by moving children out of emergency facilities as quickly as possible, expanding licensed bed capacity and expediting release to family. Our advocacy has also included our work to 
to ensure uh, that the Biden Family Reunification Task Force considers children's best interests and helps reunify as many families as possible who were separated uh, during the prior administration. Additionally, uh, we've been able to resume meetings with agency leadership that had fallen silent under the prior administration. So I, I, I hope that uh, this has helped provide some insight into our work to integrate children's best interests into both law and policy. Uh, we will continue to find avenues wherever they are to ensure that immigrant children are afforded the rights and treated with the care they deserve as children. Thank you, Robert. Uh, as we get ready to start answering questions from our audience with our panel members and policy director, Jennifer Nagda, I just want to run down a quick list of ways you can learn more and stay engaged in the fight to protect immigrant children facing deportation proceedings. You can find the Young Center on our website at www.theyoungcenter.org and on social media at the accounts listed here. On our website, you can also subscribe to our newsletter for action alerts, future webinar announce announcements, and updates on policy, or find information about hosting fundraisers, becoming a Young Center ambassador, or applying to become a child advocate volunteer. Uh, one quick note regarding questions, we do have strict protocols to protect children's privacy, so there are limits to the amount of information we share about any given child, and we appreciate your understanding in this matter. And we have received a couple of questions already during the talk. I'm going to go ahead and start with one for Robert or Jennifer to answer, as it's a policy-focused question. What can we do to support the Young Center's agenda for best interests to be included in the law? Thanks, AJ. I'm happy to field that one. Um, so I don't want to completely duplicate what AJ just said, but we try to make our outreach to the Hill strategic and focused around specific issues. Um, and to that end, we will post on social media, we will post on our website, and we will send e-blasts specific requests to our reporters saying this bill is being introduced tell your member of Congress what you think. And we will offer you talking points based around best interests. You are free to tell them whatever you think, but we will try to provide some of that language for you based on our work as child advocate. Um, so if you are not subscribed to our email service or if you don't follow us on social media, I would strongly encourage you to do so because it is a very timely way for us um, to loop you into um, specific actions around specific legislation. Um, but I would also just encourage you um, to the extent that you are engaged in conversations with your own friends and family, are active on your own social media platforms, or if you are like me and still subscribe to newspapers, um, to engage in those spaces. Write a letter to your editor. Um, share your ideas or share news that we send to you with your networks. A lot of people don't understand that there is a huge disparity between the systems that we have set up to address the needs of young people in danger in the United States and how we treat immigrant children who arrive at our border seeking protection. And one of the, the points of advocacy that we have found to be most effective is to talk about the fact that we want it all children to be treated the same. And right now our immigration system lags decades behind, as, as Daisy and Liz and Robert pointed out, other systems like the child welfare system. Um, and so having conversations around making sure that immigrant children have the right to stay with family in their homes, just as we want that um, for children who are in the domestic child welfare system can really be a place to open up that conversation. Um, and then whether you get into the details of best interests or specific laws, really you're sort of helping lay the foundation for those arguments that we will make in our briefings and with um, members of Congress around the specifics. Um, so I would encourage people to get involved on, on all of those fronts. Thank you, Jennifer. And I have a bunch of questions that have come in, so we're just going to go through them. Um, next, Daisy mentioned the involvement of external experts in Young Center bid panels when there are complex cases. How do you find and engage these experts? What are factors you consider in selecting experts for a panel? And Liz, if you want to go ahead and take this, Daisy, you can try next. 
Yeah, of course. So our bid panels always include a young center staff member that is designated as the bid supervisor. They ensure that um, everyone involved gets the agenda and all the necessary background information about the case before the meeting. A bid panel usually consists and should consist of individuals from varied disciplines and diverse backgrounds. At minimum, we seek that the bid panel include the child advocate assigned to the child's case, young center staff, an immigration attorney. However, for the most part, we do not include the immigration attorney that is assigned to the child. We get an experienced immigration attorney with an expertise in representing children um, to be the voice in this panel. We also include a child protection specialist and an expert on or from the child's country of origin. In some cases, we do look at bid panels and include experts from other relevant disciplines such as child development, juvenile justice, psychology, counseling, child maltreatment, domestic violence, and international human rights. This is all to make sure that we have a um, panel that is going to give us the best determination and has cultural knowledge and is able to give us the expertise in their field. Just wanted just to quickly add that we also um, do review with them our child's advocate paradigm so that they consider the same things that we look at when making these determinations and giving us their expert opinions and that these um, experts also volunteer um, their time and expertise. So we count their time as part of our in-kind donations to the Young Center, which is an important element of how our work is supported. Thank you both. I have another question for Team Policy now. Has the U.S. ratified the U.N.'s Convention on the Rights of the Child? And if not, is there any indication it will? So the United States remains alone among every country in the world in having failed to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And the history behind that is both complicated and terribly disappointing and directly linked um, to certain specific issues that mobilize a lot of public attention. But I will say um, that the Young Center um, within our policy team and as an organization um, is re-energizing our focus on um, the international effort to persuade the United States to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that will most certainly be an effort where we engage in a lot of outreach with our supporters and with the public. Um, I don't know that the chances are necessarily better than they have been over the last 20 years that we have been trying to make this happen, but we are cautiously optimistic that a concerted effort um, from the child rights advocacy community, not just related to immigration, but juvenile justice, racial justice, um, and protecting all aspects of children's rights, that there may be a window um, to push more aggressively or to highlight um, the country's hypocrisy in failing to, to ratify the convention. Thank you, Jennifer. And a question now for uh, the Child Advocate Program folks. Liz, in the case of Juan, who had received voluntary removal to Guatemala, it was mentioned that he is thriving currently. How and for how long is the placement monitored to ensure permanency and safety? Yes, so we uh, monitor our cases. We have check-ins. Uh, so I will continue as an advocate the calls with uh, the child and the family. Uh, we do a 30, 60, and 90 day check-in. After the 90 days, we do close out the case if every if the child is thriving and the child is doing well. However, the family or whomever they're with receives all our contact information. And this is especially important because they have the ability to contact us at any point in time to um, get any information, get resources that they may need. And we, at that point, will reopen a case and work with the family again if needed. Um, thank you. And so we have another question now, probably for Jennifer, but you guys can jump in as you know better than I do. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you are doing. I'm currently a rising bilingual school psychology, um, soon to work with the DOE, and I'm interested in hearing what I can do to um, best help immigrant students uh, and or what are the current best practices your staff engages for assessment and support. Actually, that might be child advocate program folks too. 
Annalise, it's a terrific question. I'll just answer briefly at the policy level, but then hopefully my colleagues in the Child Advocate Program can weigh in on other ways to get involved. Robert mentioned when he was speaking our collaboration with a lot of different organizations across the country, and we have collaborated on a number of issues related to the Department of Education and its support um, of immigrant students. Um, and that ranges from um, policies that are set to support children as they integrate into schools. And schools are often a place where children receive critical support and services. It may be their first contact outside of detention with a social worker or a teacher. Um, so we are deeply engaged um, in those efforts, but there are also some of the very best sort of community-based organizations that are doing work in communities with directly impacted individuals often connect through schools. Um, and my understanding is um, that under this administration, the Department of Education is doing more work to connect with those community-based organizations so it can hear from communities on the ground about what they need in their community and how best to support students. Um, but you are more than welcome, um, Annalise or anyone else, to reach out directly to Robert and I on team policy if there are ways that we could be supportive or connect with the Department of Education. We work closely with the Leadership Conference for Civil Rights, which does a lot of work um, around rights access for migrant students. So that's another possible resource. But Daisy and Liz, I'll throw it to you for ways that people um, can get engaged um, at the Child Advocate Program level. So with the Child Advocate Program level, we do have volunteer opportunities where uh, you can volunteer with us. However, we as a staff are very trauma informed and everything that we do uh, is in the interest, best interest of the child. So we are child led. Um, so we look at the framework of a child led work while also being trauma informed. And like Jennifer said, there are so many organizations on the ground doing the day to day work, ensuring that um, the families and that uh, the children are, uh, you know, integrating into the community. Um, so there's different organizations that you can reach out to. However, and Daisy, please feel free to jump in, but we do try to do everything with a trauma-informed lens and um, try to look at what the needs are and consider the child's wants and needs first, since we are child-led. All right, so we have a question here about ongoing family separations. And Robert, I think you can, you're gonna answer this one. Under what circumstances are children still being separated at the, when they, sorry, separated from adults they cross with at the border? I serve at the Catholic Charities Respite Center in McAllen, and we have been seeing large numbers of children, um, large numbers of families there. Thanks, that's a, Great question. And there's actually a potentially a, a bit of news on that. Um, so uh, essentially, you know, a large number of uh, individuals who have arrived at the border throughout this current administration uh, have been turned away um, under Title 42, which is the um, pandemic related policy that I addressed earlier. Um, you know, it, it, it came into effect under the Trump administration. Um, despite uh, the, object the objections of the CDC, um, it was put in place to summar uh, summarily uh, um, reject anyone who, who comes to the border. Uh, when the Biden administration um, uh, replaced the previous administration, um, they allowed children uh, to come in uh, despite leaving um, Title 42 in effect. Um, otherwise, um, over the weekend, uh, there were some reports that the administration um, is considering ending Title 42's application to family units, um, but it currently still does, um, and, and that's something that uh, the, the, the policy in general, we've been uh, advocating for its uh, repeal, um, and, and we would welcome uh, this move uh, to end its uh, application to, to family units, hopefully as a step in that direction. AJ, if we don't have a lot of questions coming in, I wouldn't mind offering a little bit um, more on that, but just to expand and, and maybe take us slightly away from the question, but to a point we'd really like to share 
with the audience, which is that um, under existing US law, when a child arrives at the border with somebody who is not their parent or legal guardian, there's no slip of paper saying that they are the parent or legal guardian, they are separated. And the child comes into one system of custody where we are appointed to their case and fight to get them back to family. And the adult ends up usually in adult immigration detention to be quickly deported, often without the chance to leave with the child, or they may eventually bond out of immigration custody and then we're working to reunify them. That's the way the law exists. We believe the law could be interpreted so that children who arrive with adults who have been acting as their caregiver, a grandmother, an aunt, an older brother or sister, um, that they could be evaluated at the border and be released together. Robert mentioned this earlier. Um, those children still meet that legal definition of being unaccompanied, meaning they're not with a parent or legal guardian. They should get all of those protections. But what we know from the child welfare field, from the child health field, is that kids are better and safer when they are with family. And so we are really pushing this administration to find ways to keep some of those kids who arrive with a loving caregiver together at the border so that they can be released and aren't separated. Um, but I think it's fair to say that when kids are separated under the law because they're not with a parent or legal guardian, that for many kids is a form of family separation. It arose from a desire to protect kids from traffickers and that's important, but there are ways to identify traffickers and figure out who really is a loving auntie or a grandma or the older sister who's been caring for her siblings since their mother passed away. We think that can be done, it's hard, but this is the administration to try and start doing that work. And so we are fighting very hard on that front to end that form of family separation. And Jennifer, do you want to add anything else um, about how upholding Title 42 against family units is encouraging its family separation decisions being made by families across the border? I'm happy to, and we'll do it in one minute instead of the three hours that all of us could talk about it. But when you have a policy um, that says because of a pandemic, asylum seekers can't enter the United States and exercise their legal right to seek asylum and you force them to wait across the border in a country that is not their own. When they are still in danger in that country, some of those parents will make the very difficult decision to separate from their children so that their children can seek safety alone at the border. And so by maintaining this policy of turning away family units, parents arriving with children at the border, we're perpetrating a new form of family separation because it is not safe for families from Haiti, from Ecuador, from Central America, from Africa and Asia to wait in Mexico, a country that is not their own, where they have no place to live, where they have no ability to work, where they are vulnerable to exploitation, Parents who want to save their kids' lives will do whatever they need to to save their kids' lives, and that means sometimes sending them over alone. And the federal government won't turn away children who arrive alone, but it will turn away families. So we very much believe at the Young Center that this so-called pandemic policy, the Title 42 policy, was fundamentally wrong to begin with. There was no reason to turn away just asylum seekers during the pandemic, but allow business travelers and tourists and students to continue traveling. Um, when there was good evidence that some of those business travelers and tourists posed an even greater public health threat than asylum seekers. So the policy was flawed to begin with, but the fact that it continues to exist now is really forcing families to make terrible decisions um, to separate. And I think those separations are just as much forced by our government and unnecessary um, as other forms of separation have been, and we are working very hard to end that policy. Thank you so much. And I think we have time for one last question before we have to wrap this up uh, about the Border Patrol screening of children. Um, I'm also interested in whether your policy work with the administration to recognize the child's best interests, what work, if any, is being done to apply this standard to unaccompanied Mexican children, which in practice, CBP routinely blocks from access to protection and immediately returns them without a best interest determination? Does someone from team program want to talk about 
screening, I can then chime in on the screening of Mexican children and how we have routinely failed children from Mexico. Sure. Um, so when we, I know that when uh, the children do arrive, they go through a process of assessments um, at the shelters that they are at. At that point, um, it is determined what country uh, they are from. However, like Jennifer said earlier, if they do arrive by themselves, they are put in the care of the ORR office, which allows us to then work with them and try to determine their best interest. Um, so we have worked with uh, several that are from Mexico and have been able to practice our best interest determination paradigm on uh, their cases and have been successful in keeping many of these children in the United States that have arrived on their own. Um, and part of that is just the work that we are doing on a daily basis, the individual work, but also the work that we do with the shelters and the um, connections that we make with the shelters to ensure that these cases are being referred to us. So it is a daily conversation with every shelter about kids coming in, whether maybe they are um, you know, eligible to be a part of our program and then getting those referrals so that we can be matched with them and advocate for their best interest at that point. So that law that Liz mentioned that requires all unaccompanied children to be taken into protective custody discriminates against kids from contiguous countries, which is Mexico and Canada, which means primarily children from Mexico. And children from Mexico under the laws that exist right now, which we are hoping to change, um, only allows them to come into custody if they demonstrate that they have a fear of persecution or that they can't exercise their independent judgment to return to their home country, a legal standard that I as a lawyer do not really understand, much less a child arriving at the border has to make that case. And the people who make that determination are the Customs and Border Patrol officials, the uniformed armed guards who are patrolling the border. So they determine whether a Mexican child has a fear of persecution. They determine whether they have a fear of trafficking or whether they can make an independent determination to withdraw their claim for admission. And that's a terrible system. It doesn't work. Um, and one of our former colleagues who's now at First Focus, Miriam Abaya, wrote a terrific piece about how that law has completely failed Mexican children and returned them to situations of danger. You can find that report on our website. Um, so it is definitely something that is on our policy agenda to tackle with this administration. Thank you all and thank you to all of our attendees. Um, if we have, I think, one or two unanswered questions, we're going to do our best to follow up with you via email to make sure that you can get your answers to those questions. And thank you for asking so many terrific questions, everyone. That was really fantastic. Um, a recording of this webinar with the slides and a transcription will be available on our website and shared on social media and emailed to everyone who RSVP'd to today's event. That'll take a couple of days. And then finally, we just wanted to say thank you so much for being on our side in this ongoing fight to preserve immigrant children's rights. We are incredibly grateful for your support.